continue on here. The good news about uh, the next topic is it's typically going to be an optional additional topic that we would normally find in a thermodynamics one course. The main thing that we would have to cover in a thermodynamics one course is what we just took exam three over. That would be um, uh, a good comprehensive understanding of the first law and, and a good basic understanding of the second law. And that's really what exam three tests and then we'll We'll reiterate that on the final and, and reevaluate that and give you an opportunity to improve if needed right, between the exams. Uh, so where we're at here is um, just a brief intro, kind of a peer into chapter nine. Right? So in the Chengal and Bowles text, chapter nine is going to talk about ideal gas cycles. Specifically for us, we're going to focus on a cycle we call the auto cycle. O-T-T-O, -T -T -O, not A-U-T-O, even though with my accent it sounds like auto cycle. It's auto cycle. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the diesel cycle. Write this down and see which one looks better. So we'll talk briefly about the diesel cycle. Okay, so that's we're going to focus on the auto cycle. The auto cycle will show up on the final. So uh, there's a homework assignment out. Um, get an opportunity to to look through some of these problems. We probably won't get to example problems today. That's not our goal. Our goal is to lay down some theory. So um, on in on Tuesday I'll put out some videos. To uh, really work through an example auto cycle problem and then maybe talk briefly about the diesel cycle. Okay, so today we're just going to get up to the th uh, talk about the theory and be ready to work example problems. So let's get there. Uh, in chapter six, we talked about the Carnot cycle, and that's the first reversible ideal cycle that we introduce typically in a thermodynamics course. Um, it's one of the best cycles we can imagine because it is reversible. So any reversible cycle is the best possible version of a cycle to operate an engine or a refrigeration device because it's reversible. And a heat engine and a refrigerator are, are essentially the opposites of each other. However, uh, we don't really have anything that operates in a Carnot cycle, so there's that. We don't, we can't really point to this uh, device and say, oh, this is a perfectly good example of something that's like a Carnot cycle. We don't have anything like. So what that what happens then is we end up identifying or putting together some other ideal cycles that uh, mimic um, types of engines or cycles that do exist that we do have the technology to operate. Now these are what we call ideal cycles. Right? Ideal cycles are cycles that um, well they have idealizations, and, and what that means is there are assumptions that we can make to um, to simplify the analysis. Okay, uh, what and, and this diagram is in your text. Uh, what is meant by that is, is, for example, think about. So I've got an actual cycle here in this dotted line, and you've got an idealized cycle that is very close in shape and size, but not exact. Now we're displaying that on a PV diagram, pressure with respect to volume. Why? Why would we do that? Right? And I'm pausing here because it's out of habit. Normally when I present this in a face-to-face -face class, I wait until I get some answers. Why? Why would we care about how something appears on a PV diagram? What does a PV diagram tell us? Well, let me ask a little more straightforward question to prompt you along. What is represented by the area of these shapes. What does the area on a PV diagram represent? Well, how do you find area? Well, you can integrate to find area. So what does the integral of pressure with respect to volume represent? That represents work, right? So the integral of pressure with respect to volume representing work, the area bound by these curves 
tells us the work that these cycles can produce, or if it's a refrigeration cycle, they represent the work required for the cycle to operate. Now, what are we talking about on this slide? We're talking about idealizations. And, and again, I'm saying, look, you've got an ideal cycle and an actual cycle. The ideal cycle being the one that's the solid line. And if you can see colors, that's more of a black line there. Now, think about this. If I needed to integrate these functions, and if you look at this dotted line curve, the actual cycle curve, and if I needed to integrate that curve, find the area bound by that curve, well, that's, you would need to know these functions or the function that describes this curve. It's probably not a single function. It's probably a piecewise function. You probably have a function here. You probably have a function here, another function here, and another function for the rest of the curve. So you probably have different functions. You're going to integrate them piecewise. Maybe some of them are complicated as opposed to, say, this function, or this curve, the ideal cycle curve, notice really all, all I would need to do here is find the area underneath this curve minus the area underneath this curve. The difference between those two, because these are verticals, the integrals for these verticals would be zero. There's no area under these vertical curves. So really all I would have to do is find the area under this curve minus the area under this curve, and that difference tells me the work output for the ideal cycle. And as you can see, the, the shape is very close um, to the actual cycle. And again, these are assumptions that we can make to keep the analysis reasonably straightforward and still get us reasonable accuracy. It gives us a good approximation, even if it's not exact. Okay, so and that's the idea of a, or the idea. <laughs> that is the point of an ideal cycle, is we employ idealizations to allow us to uh, have more straightforward analysis, more straightforward calculations to actually find uh, the quantities that we see, the quantities we're interested in. Most of the time, as engineers, that's work, especially if we're trying to extract the most work out of this thing. Now, um, and don't worry, we're not going to do a lot of integrals. If we do any, they're going to be pretty straightforward and simple. Okay? Um, but I don't think we're going to do any. I think we just need to understand mechanically how they work. But let's talk about what are some idealizations that we can employ and that are typically employed. Um, when we're talking about, in Chapter 9, we're talking about ideal gas cycles. And these are two of the ideal gas cycles we'll look at. And there are others if you look deeper into Chapter 9. These are just the two we're going to focus on because it's just an introductory thermal course. So what are some of the assumptions we can make to make these ideal cycles? Well, we can assume that this air is an ideal gas. And as we've discussed before, at higher pressures, ideal gases don't really behave ideally, but it, it still provides a reasonable estimate. And it's also going to be cycling in a closed loop. Okay, so we're going to trap a bubble of air in the system and it's going to go through some kind of cyclic process and we're going to assume that air behaves like an ideal gas. Sorry, I'm trying to stay hydrated. They're drinking some water. The second one is all processes in the cycle are reversible. So again, it's an ideal cycle. It's the best version of a cycle. So we're going to assume all these processes are, are reversible. They're not generating new entropy meaning we can get both the system and the surroundings back to their initial state because there's no new entropy that we can't destroy once it exists. The next one, so the point of both the auto and the diesel cycle is to be ideal representations of uh, internal combustion engines. Right? And in an in internal combustion engine, you're going to have an air-fuel mixture that you'll inject into the engine you're going to combust it, you're going to burn that air-fuel mixture, and that's going to generate heat, and that's going to cause an increase in pressure and temperature within the, the engine. We're not going to worry about the chemistry associated with the combustion process. Some of you will go on later to take coursework in industrial, or I'm sorry, in internal combustion engines, where you can talk about the chemical reactions and the chemistry and the stoichiometry associated with the combustion process. We also have to talk about, all right, well, is the combustion complete? Does, do all of the, does all of the fuel actually burn? 
right? Um, how much does not burn? Do we know? Can we measure that? Well, we, the answer is yes, but we don't care in this course. Some of you will care later. We don't care in this course. We're just concerned with how much heat do we add to the system for each loop in the cycle, right? right? So um, instead of worrying about an air fuel mixture burning, we're just going to say, let's just take a bubble of air right, operating as ideal gas, and we're going to add heat to it. And instead of exhausting the spent burnt air fuel mixture so the process is ready to repeat, we're just going to say, you know, let's just reject the heat that couldn't be converted as work out, and, um, and that's what we're going to use to repeat the cycle. So that's kind of the idea there. Now, another common assumption is the cold air assumption. And so we're going to assume that uh, if we make the cold air assumption, we're going to assume that specific heat is constant. And this is one thing I've tried to get on uh, several of you about the homework. If you've noticed, if you've lost homework points on an ideal gas problem where you've used specific heat and have said this value is too low, it's because you're not using a specific heat at a high enough temperature. Um, that's another discussion. And we've already talked about that several times, so I'm not going to bore you with that. If you need review on that, go back to the previous videos. Or send me an email, I'll try to point you in the right direction. We may not do that in this case. A lot of problems, they'll tell you, feel free to make the cold air assumption. If you make the cold air assumption, that means you're going to assume the specific heat stays constant. And that it stays constant at room temperature. Now, it's only an estimate, but again, this is an ideal cycle. We've, this is an idealization that we can employ to keep the analysis reasonably straightforward. Still get a reasonable amount of accuracy. Um, there are ways that we can assume variable specific heat, and that's okay. And we talked about that in Chapter 7, where um, you can use table properties. A lot of times those will assume variable specific heat. Um, there are examples in the text if you want to learn how to do that. But the, the problems I'm going to ask you to do, you're more than welcome to assume cold air assumption. And in, in, in a test problem, or that, that would show up on the final, I will put in that test problem. That you're welcome to us make the cold air assumption. Okay. Now, what does this look like? And this is not a great graphic. I need to rescan this. This is from your textbook. Okay. I need to get a higher res, higher resolution image of this, but let's go ink and let's do black ink on this. Um, <clears throat> the auto cycle. The auto cycle is an ideal cycle for what we call spark ignition engines. So your gasoline, your CNG, right? So we can write that. And how does my stylus used to work? But this this particular stylus does not work, and I don't have another one, so we'll just I'll continue with my finger. This is gasoline engines. Um, there was a time where converting to compressed natural gas was popular. Um, that's not necessarily as popular here in the United States anymore because of price differences, but um, there's some political implications behind that. Let's not talk about. <laughs> but um, any kind of engine where you have a spark plug, and, and unless you know a lot about engines, you may not know whether you've got that. If you've got a gasoline engine, it's operating in a spark ignition sequence. Um, and the auto cycle is the ideal cycle that mimics those spark ignition engines. So most of you, unless you're driving a diesel engine, um, or unless you're driving a fully electric vehicle, you're probably using a spark ignition engine in your vehicle. If you're adding if you're adding gasoline or CNG to your engine, you're, you're using a spark ignition sequence. Now, the auto cycle, again, the ideal cycle that mimics the spark ignition sequence, starts out first with an isentropic compression. That's not a bad place to stop. We'll continue on there on the next video.